Good evening, everybody. Welcome to yet another Blockbuster event. This is going to be a very exciting evening. Um, so on behalf of Stern, I want to officially extend and welcome to our two guests. Both of them are Stern alums back to campus uh, this evening. Dr. Alan Greenspan first. Um, Dr. Greenspan holds not one, not two, but three NYU degrees. He's, this is the 70th year of his anniversary of his completing his undergrad, undergrad in 1948, a master's in 1950, and his PhD in 1977. Um, and uh, of course, his record and his uh, fame need no further introduction. I just wanted to mention the multiple NYU degrees. Um, John Paulson, also a Stern alum, uh, undergrad 1978. President of Paulson and Company, NYU trustee, a very generous donor to NYU, and also importantly a member of the Stern Board of Overseers, his proudest office. Um, and of course, welcome back to Mervyn. Um, Mervyn King, as you all know, served as the governor of Bank of England for 10 years during some of its toughest times. And now I'm proud to say he's a colleague and professor at NYU. Today is in many ways an extraordinary coming together, not just because of the eminence of each of the three of the people on stage, but because of the extraordinary way in which they are connected. Mervyn currently sits, or is currently has the Alan Greenspan, Alan Greenspan Chair of Economics at Stern. The Alan Greenspan Chair at Stern was endowed by John Paulson. <laughs> um, so John's uh, generous gift to the uh, school, we end out a chair in, 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 in Dr. Greenspan's name, in John Paulson's name, also provided us with significant facility, money for facilities renovation, as you know, from the Paulson Auditorium and others. OK, one last point before we begin this evening. Um, matter of housekeeping. We will, as we always do at these events, be taking questions from the audience. The la after about 30 minutes of conversation, the last 15 minutes will be devoted to questions from the audience. As always, questions, please write them down on your note cards. People will pick them up, and then they will uh, uh, deliver them to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the speakers. So a selection of your questions is all that we will have time for. But when you write down your questions, please remember to write down your name and your affiliation, student, alumni, whatever your affiliation is, please remember to write that down. Thank you, and over to Marvin King. Well, <laughs> Thank you very much, Raghu. Hello, good evening, and welcome to you all for this In Conversation With event. It's a great privilege for me to share the platform with Alan and John. Before I became governor of the Bank of England, I went to see Alan in Washington, and the advice he gave me then was the most valuable advice I ever had before I took up the position. When I left the Bank of England, I, of course, I became unemployed. And I'm deeply grateful for John for endowing the position and Alan to give his, <laughs> give his name to it so that I could once again be employed. Uh, thank you for that. Now, there's a twist on the, the, the event tonight. As you know, for these events, I normally put the questions to the invited guest. But there's a change tonight, because John wanted to be, a, be able to put questions to Alan and myself. So he will moderate the, the questions. Alan and I will try to provide answers. And we hope that you will also, when you put your questions, put some to John as well. So we, <laughs> he has to answer at some point. So thank you very much for all for coming. And let me hand over to John. Well. Thank you uh, for having all of us here tonight. I want to say what it is, is it's a great honor for me as well to be here and to be uh, interviewing both Mervyn King and Alan Greenspan, I think uh, two of the greatest uh, central bankers in our lifetime. Um, it's, it's, it's every time I have an opportunity to either meet with them or talk with them or read about them, I always learn something. So, uh, and I'm sure we will learn, I will learn, as we all will, something today. I'll start off with uh, Alan. By the way, Alan has not three, but four degrees from NYU. He has two doctorates, one of which he reminded me is honorary. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that probably holds a record for any of our uh, uh, NYU alumni. Uh, starting with uh, Alan, 
In a recent interview with Barron's, you highlighted several threats to the booming economy. Among these were a booming deficit, uh, potential for soaring inflation, a uh, falling U.S. savings rate, and a bond market bubble. Uh, starting first with the uh, deficit, the, the principal cause of the deficit, as you outlined in the interview, was the rapidly rising entitlement spending. And that's been a concern of yours for a long time. Uh, is there a solution to this problem? I think there is. And uh, the Swedes in 1991 uh, were far, farther down the road than we were, and their system collapsed. Sweden, as you may remember, uh, was the quintessential socialist economy in World War II in the West more than anyone, more than any others. And a central theme in the Swedish uh, economic structure, so to speak, was what, what we, we would call social benefits. Uh, and uh, they uh, were very much where we are today. Uh, which is short of where they ended up, they eventually came to grips with the problem because long-term interest rates temporarily rose to 500%, an extraordinary number. The whole thing was unwinding. They brought in a new government, and uh, they managed to stabilize it by the types of things we ought to be doing today. And uh, I say in, in, a, in a, a book that just came out uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, Adrian Woldridge, uh, that we would be far better positioned than ourselves if we'd looked at the experience of Sweden and recognize there were two critical areas where they fundamentally turned themselves around. The, I don't know how many of you follow the details. Uh, I hope you don't have to do it, it's a social security system in the United States. But one of the crucial issues is that our system is a defined benefit system, meaning that there's a legal obligation of the federal government to make certain payments as specified by the law, but the funding of that is not automatic by any means. And as you might understand very readily, because we see it all the time, that the uh, basic position of the, uh, the political system is always to spend more and tax less. And I find it fascinating. It tells you more than you want to know. But in the 2018 uh, annual report of the actuaries uh, and governors of the Social Security system uh, is a, a the usual discussion. Then on page 299 or thereabouts, uh, they say that uh, actuarially the system that we've just discussed is unsound. And that to make it sound, to make it short, for shorten some of the suggestions, you'd have to cut benefits 25% starting now and forever into the future. And uh, having read it at that point, uh, what we did in putting it in the book is if you wanted to know what the most important thing in the whole structure of, the, of the, uh, this year's report uh, is that they stuck it so far in the back that hopefully nobody would see it. <laughs> and that tells you all you need to know. Our suggestion is that they convert from, uh, that we convert 
from this defined benefit to a defined contribution, which is like the 401ks, where you cannot run out of money because you can't pay a benefit unless you have it. And so you don't get, as we have now, a major contributor to the federal deficit. And indeed, when you're talking about the ballooning, ballooning deficit, it is primarily the entitlements, not only Social Security, but Medicare uh, and a whole series of others. And uh, we recommend that uh, uh, something very drastic occur in today's politics. Uh, I don't foresee it happening. Let me ask you two, two questions on that. Did, did Sweden switch to a defined contribution from a defined benefit plan? They did. They did. And that was, that was their major change. Mm. Now, the argument is that saying, well, Sweden is very small compared to the United States. But remember what we're talking about is a process where size is not relevant. It's merely the relationship between yeah. each individual's receipts and expenditures and whether there are a thousand or a million doesn't change the principle. So those who say, well, yes, Sweden is working fine, mm. but that's because it's a small country. Well, that's a true, that's a true fact, yeah, I, I but think, irrelevant. I think that's very good advice. Most, uh, most co companies today, almost all companies today are defined contribution plans. Uh, those that kept the defined benefit plans the big steel companies, the big auto companies, ultimately went bankrupt uh, because of the unfunded liabilities that defined benefit plans created. Uh, really, the only sectors where defined benefit plans exist is in public service sectors, either state and local utilities, which also have big issues, as well as the federal government. Uh, regarding inflation, uh, inflation today is still relatively muted. I think the numbers came out, it was around 2% using the uh, preferred uh, Fed inflation measure. Uh, you, you mentioned a number in the interview of 4 to 5%. Uh, is that where you think inflation could go in the future? And do you have any estimate on timing? Well, I was using that mainly as a measure of when does the political system respond against inflation? And I think American history says it's about 4 to 5 percent. Uh, Richard Nixon invoked wage and price controls when the consumer's price index was, I think, rising 3 and a, three and a half percent. Under that, it has no political impact. And this whole discussion is 95 percent political. So I'm saying 4 or 5 percent seems <coughs> to be and the few examples we have where all of a sudden uh, you get a political response and despite the fact that wage and price controls have never worked, uh, that does not prevent people from continue, continuously trying to do it. Because that's the only thing they can do, and except do the right thing, I should say. Uh, regarding uh, the low savings rate, uh, you, you, you mentioned that that's one of the contributors uh, to the low productivity growth we've had uh, recently. Uh, can we reverse the trend of, of low productivity growth? Or is this something that mature economies like ourselves are doomed to? Well, let's first, uh, uh, let me tell you where the, the issue first came up, much to my surprise. Not in this book, but the previous book, which about five years ago, I was looking at a set of data and I observed something which struck me as extraordinarily peculiar, namely that the benefits of uh, recipients of Social Security and Medicare uh, as a percent of gross domestic product and Gross domestic savings is a percent of GDP. If you add them both together, they have, starting from 1965, it's a very fairly stable flat line, which arithmetically requires 
that one is driving out the other. And it's very simple to decide which it is because one is a political issue, the other is an economic issue. So the question of what is mandated in, under Social Security is the driving force, which is another way of saying that the data unequivocally show that uh, entitlements are driving out savings, but savings plus savings borrowed from abroad is actually very close to gross domestic investment. Gross domestic investment is the key determinant of productivity. It's actually the capital stock, uh, but that's essentially uh, accumulating uh, the expenditures. And uh, so we're sitting with a situation which is pretty clear at this stage that uh, entitlements are crowding out uh, investment and therefore slowing down productivity. Productivity is now at the lowest level it's been, productivity growth, I should say, is at the very lowest level it's been in quite a substantial period of time. And uh, what that tells you is you get a level of GDP, because it's obviously related to productivity, which is at levels that politically create populism. And how we got where we are today, I attribute essentially to the 1935 Act and what happened subsequent to that. And so we're sitting now with a situation where we have very low productivity increases. And indeed, that is true in all the developed world at this stage. And that means that you get a level, lower level of GDP growth, which is exactly the condition that generates populism, always has and always will. Populism, finally, let me just say, is not a philosophy like communism or capitalism. Uh, it's a cry of help. A populist is suffering. They don't know where the, what the cause is. And they're saying, uh, so somebody will jump onto the stage and say, I know, what the, I know how to solve this. That's the standard way it happens all the time. It's happening in the United States today. Uh, just one uh, clarification. When you said the entitlement spending plus savings reaches a number that's been relatively constant, what is that number, and how are the components shifted? Well, the point is that I've forgotten the exact number. It doesn't, almost doesn't matter. The, the important issue is it's the same yeah. number. Okay. Uh, and so what, if you look at the entitlements as they grow, the remainder, which is save, domestic savings, slows okay. down. Yep. I see. All right, let me switch to uh, Mervyn. Can I, um, one comment? Yes, I, yeah. All central bank governors have to deal with finance ministers. Not always a happy experience. But I will never forget the G7 meetings of finance ministers and central bank governors when seven finance ministers, all powerful men, would look like adoring first-year students at Allen as he talked about the world economy. And the, you could see them all writing down, page 299 of the annual report, <laughs> in order to go back home and impress their colleagues at home that they'd <laughs> listened to the maestro and they'd learnt and understood something from that meeting. The rest of us were terribly envious of the power that Allen had over all these finance ministers. You should have, you should have told me. I didn't know, and therefore <laughs> it stopped. Now you know. Well, I think Mervyn has made a good point that, uh, you know, we've reached a mature state in our economy, that uh, productivity growth is slow, and that's resulted in lower GDP growth, which is, uh, you know, causing populism to rise. And the, the question is, how can we get back to uh, faster rates of growth? And, and the, the issue is that the savings, which is a combination of 
savings plus entitlement spendings is, is, is a certain number, and to the extent entitlement savings crowds out the savings, that will lead to lower growth. So he's pointing us to what we have to resolve, and we have to resolve entitlement spending. And the biggest component of that is Social Security, and he's proffering the solution. It's, it's switching to defined contribution from defined benefit, and that makes all the sense in the world. You, you know, pensions are a form of saving. You should get in what you, you should get back what you ultimately put in, but if you get back more than you put in, it creates problems for future generations. So I think that's a, it's a model. It worked for Sweden. It worked completely in the private sector here in the U.S. And likely over the long term is going to be the solution we need to implement both at the <coughs> federal level and the state and local level. So Can that's I make a, a point a, on this? Yeah. Which, yeah. So I think the United Kingdom shares with the United States the problem that Alan identified. We save too little. As a share of national income, we just don't save enough. But interestingly, countries like China and Germany, or in, for that matter, the monetary union area in Europe as a whole, save too much. And they will need to reduce their saving ratios in order for us to get back to a healthy world economy, I think. So there's the making there not just of issues for domestic policy, mm. but of the opportunity for a degree of, if not international cooperation, at least understanding that we need to make some quite big structural changes in the world economy. It's not just a question of interest yep. rates, yep. not just you know trade measures. There are some patterns of spending that are unsustainable. Good point. Uh, moving to Brexit, which is right now front and center, not only in the UK, but in all of Europe. Uh, just to back up a moment, perhaps you can explain what were the concerns about EU measurement that led to the referendum initially and the exit vote? So I think this is important because it's very easy for people outside the United Kingdom just to assume unthinkingly that all right-thinking people know that this is a terrible thing to do. So the question is why was it that if you take England as a whole which has nine standard regions, eight of them voted to leave, and only one, London, voted to remain. And I think in part it's because there was a degree of both complacency and arrogance about successive British governments that believed that, well, you know, this, this political project in Europe, you know, it's obviously a bit you know, highfalutin. That's the kind of thing that continentals do. You know, they talk about philosophy and politics. We're pragmatic. We'll keep them feet on the ground by just discussing economics. And in doing that, we completely ignored the fact that the rest of the EU was serious about the political project. And they did go ahead and create a monetary union against the advice of most economists. They went ahead and did it for political reasons. It's a project to ensure greater political integration in Europe. And of course, the key point is, which something which Winston Churchill stressed after the Second World War, when he was keen on European integration, it just it shouldn't include the UK. And uh, <laughs> the fact is he was right, because this project is one that most other European countries want, but it's not one that the people or political parties in the UK want. And so the two big issues that arose in the campaign one was a loss of national sovereignty, which was obvious to anyone who thought about it, but which successive British governments had denied was happening. Instead of arguing that there was a case for sharing sovereignty in particular policy areas, they simply said, no, there's no loss of sovereignty. And we ended up in a position where you know, two thirds of the detailed laws and regulations that apply to daily British life were being determined in Brussels and not in the House, in the houses, in the house of Parliament. So, uh, that was one area. The other, of course, was immigration, where it was Britain that pushed to uh, ensure that Eastern European countries could join the EU. There was an accession agreement. There was a transitional arrangement, which France and Germany took advantage of, which meant they didn't have to allow free movement of people from Eastern Europe into, the, into their countries straight away. They could bring it in over 15 years. The UK didn't take any notice of that. We just said, yeah, come into the UK whenever you want. 
the government predicted that you know, a total of between 10 and 30,000 people would come in. It turned out to be over a million. And all the way through, the British government was either denying that this was happening or promising that they would stop it, and they had no ability to stop it at all. So we culminated with a total loss of trust and confidence in the electorate in the British government in respect of issues to do with Europe. And in the end, since these split both parties down the middle, they didn't raise it, it didn't form any feature of a general election. There was never an opportunity to vote on these issues. And it was the United Kingdom Independence Party that rose from nothing. It was a single issue campaign to have a referendum on EU membership. And you know, Nigel Farage, who started the party and promoted it, not most people's favorite politician, actually he's achieved more in terms of British politics than almost anyone else in the post-war period. Uh, and that's a condemnation of the rest of the political class, that they didn't tackle these issues. And in the campaign itself, what you could see was that the Leave campaign said, we want to regain sovereignty, we want to limit immigration, and we simply cannot do that as a member of the EU. Those were facts. The government had no answer to this, so it simply said, gosh, uh, we have no answer to these questions, so what we'll do is to assume that people vote with their wallets and we'll tell them all that they're all going to be much worse off if we vote to leave. Now, no one knows the long-run consequences of this. I think it's hard to believe that in the long run, once we've adjusted, it'll be that significant. Um, trade will carry on. Uh, both sides want a free trade agreement. The current deal does nothing to bring that about, of course. But uh, it, this attempt by the government called Project Fear in the, in the press, to say to everyone, look, you know, you don't really understand these issues. We do. We're in government. You're all going to be £4,300 per family worse off if we vote to leave. And there'll be a recession if you mm. vote to leave. Well, people voted to leave. There wasn't a recession. No one knows what the long-run effects will be. But this, this attempt to treat the electorate with a degree of contempt you know, the, the election campaign was not one in which the government said, look, of course there are arguments for leaving. Yeah. There are also arguments for remaining. And my judgment as prime minister is that on balance, this is not the moment to make that leap into the dark. That sort of, hmm. you know, honest, open well, argument was never put. Let me ask you, do you think the UK would be better off inside or outside the EU? I don't know in the long run whether we'll be better off or worse off. As I said, I don't actually think it's likely to make an enormous difference. And I don't think joining the European Union made an enormous difference. The big changes to Britain's economic performance since the Second World War were first adopting a macroeconomic policy framework which regarded monetary policy as the answer to high inflation. Remember, inflation in Britain touched 27% in the mid-1970s and taking public finances seriously, having a coherent framework for the public finances, which became a bipartisan approach. It wasn't just one party, both parties committed to it. And on the other hand, a recognition that competition was a crucial to the success of a market economy, and we privatized a lot of the state-owned enterprises. I've never forgotten that when, in the late 1970s, I went to Birmingham to my first chair in economics, moved into my apartment, I wanted a telephone. No mobile phones at that stage. No one had heard of a mobile phone. All landlines. Went down to British Telecom, said, I'd like a telephone. Complete state monopolist. Of course, sir, you can have a telephone. Well, how long will it take? About six months was the answer. Six months? There's a shortage of numbers, sir. I mean, state monopolies are not the most efficient providers of services. And no young person today has any idea how bad those state services were at that point. These are the things that transformed the British economy, not mm. actually joining the EU. Mm. And I think it's the British failure to face up to the fact that this is a political project, which the other countries take seriously, that we don't share. And the big weakness in the British approach, I think David Cameron's mistake, was not to say, look, why don't you in the EU create two categories of membership, one for those in the monetary union and one for those outside mm -hmm. it? Because you in the monetary union have to go to some degree of political integration, fiscal union or whatever, in order to have any hope of keeping this thing going. But there's no reason why the rest of us have to join mm. a political union. And indeed, all we will do if we stay in the EU is to try and make your life difficult.
That, that, there's no point to that. Create two categories of membership. I think if that had been done, and if more powers over migration had been repatriated to the national level, which every other country actually wanted, then uh, the UK would be in the EU, well, we are in the EU still today, but next March we wouldn't be leaving. Mm. Uh, let me ask you, the, the Brexit, the UK expressing its dissatisfaction uh, by voting to leave the EU, other fissures are developing in the U European Union, uh, perhaps more serious than Brexit, notably Italy. Uh, because the UK is not part of the monetary union, they can leave while it's disruptive, it's, it's not cataclysmic. However, Italy leaving the currency union uh, could be potentially uh, cataclysmic for the financial system. So let me ask you first and then Alan, do you think it's Italy will avoid a default? Uh, and do you think they can or will be able to stay in the Euro monetary union? So I think the monetary union will try very hard to avoid an Italian default because the path on which they're embarked is one where they would like to see some degree of fiscal union at the end of the road. But Italian debt's the third biggest bond market. I think there's a massive issue here. Many German monetary economists would like to go back to the original conception of monetary union in which each country is responsible for its own debt. And if Italy needs to default, well, that's Italy's problem. Uh, there's a no bailout clause in the European Treaty that has not been enforced. The European Court of Justice has basically just ignored it altogether. So I think they have real tensions and real difficulties. But I don't know, it, politics will determine where this goes. And the question is whether people in Southern Europe are prepared to put up with enough pain in order to keep this project afloat. The thing that always strikes me is if you ask people, not just in Italy, but around the monetary union, are you happy with the economic consequences of what's happening? A resounding no. That's why new parties are, are rising in popularity. If you ask them, do you want to be in the euro? They say yes. And it's a bit like, I remember my father once saying, he said, you know, this euro thing, it's not a bad idea. I wouldn't mind if we had the euro, provided we had our own interest rate. Hmm. <laughs> Well, uh, I don't think, you know, most people will agree that this, the euro has not been good to Italy. I think uh, Italy is essentially flatlined in GDP since they joined the uh, European Union, and its per yeah. capita income on a relative basis has declined considerably. Uh, now their debt to GDP outside of Greece is the highest. It's like 135%. And they, and they continue to run at a, a, with a deficit and very low growth. So let me ask the same question to Alan. If you think this is a sustainable situation or if it, Italy will eventually realize the, you know, that the best solution for them is to go back to the lira, which would in effect be a default on their euro obligations again, which would have very serious consequences for the financial system. Well, I think the system is inherently unsound uh, economically, and I'm surprised it's lasted this long. Uh, I don't really remember, but uh, on the J January 1st, 1999 uh, implementation of the euro, I, for the two or three months prior to that, said it's an infeasible unstable system. And I was uh, shocked when January 1st, 1999 uh, uh, showed up and nothing happened. Smooth adjustment. Of course, 10 years later, it fell apart. And it fell apart for the right reasons. Uh, I think that uh, it's uh, a problem which uh, the individual countries which within the Eurozone are pulling apart and have been doing so for years, but the numbers are such as they're getting too large. You have the situation where, for example, the, the Bundesbank uh, has a net credit 
against the rest of the Eurozone of uh, 900 billion euro. Uh, and uh, Luxembourg is the second creditor. But remember, Luxembourg is a, a, a steel company and German, uh, German banks. And, uh, that's sort of irrelevant to the situation. But uh, if we ever went back, we, we broke up the, the, the euro and Germany went back to the Deutsche Mark its unemployment rate would run into some serious trouble politically, or at least the perception is that. But uh, the system continues to seem to work. Uh, it shouldn't, uh, but you can't go against the reality of it. Uh, I don't think it was a good idea to begin with. I still don't uh, think it's a good idea, but remember, its roots go all the way back to the end of World War II. Uh, World War II, we came out with uh, two major confrontations occurring on European soil in a single generation. Uh, what you could have in a situation such as that is uh, considerable fear, and Adenauer and de Gaulle, representing France and Germany, saying, we were the combatants. If we now go into the post-World War II period in some form of harmony, which basically is where the euro ultimately comes from, and the whole structure of uh, European organizations, whatever one may say about how Europe has handled itself, it seems to have worked. Mm. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, it works because of France and Germany by themselves essentially running the system. Mm. Uh, we want to open this up for questions, so we will pass around uh, cards. If you'd like to ask a question, please write your name and affiliation on the card, and then uh, we'll answer as many questions uh, as we can. While we're waiting for the uh, cards to uh, come forward, uh, let me ask you another question. We had a mini sovereign uh, crisis, debt crisis in Europe, I think in 2012, when uh, Spain, Spain and Italian yields <coughs> exceeded 7% and both uh, countries had difficulty financing themselves. At that point, Mario Draghi and the ECB stepped in with the EU's version of quantitative easing, and that drove yields. It was a rather massive program. Um, the EU, ECB buying sovereign debt from these countries and other countries, and that caused yields to plummet to historic lows. Uh, but with, there's always when there's an action, there's a reaction. Obviously, if printing money or central banks buying sovereign debt had no repercussions, they would do it all the time. So let me ask uh, first Marvin, then we'll go to uh, Mervin, and then go to Alan. What, what do you think will be the long-term repercussions of quantitative easing? Can I first go back to 2012 yeah. and the statement that Draghi made, we'll do whatever it takes to keep the euro together. At that point, they didn't actually engage in significant purchase of government bonds. Um, the markets believed that the commitments of Draghi and the political leaders would be enough. Later on, they engaged, and of course, they came up with a proposal for outright monetary transactions, which was a euphemism. Uh, they chose that because it made it sound as if it was something that central banks did. But actually what they were proposing was that they would buy Italian and Spanish and Greek bonds, but not German or Dutch bonds. And they, were not, they never did any transactions of this kind. The German Constitutional Court raised some question marks about it. The European Court of Justice produced a ruling which basically said, well, if the ECB thinks 
it would like to do it, then it's got to be monetary policy because that's what central banks do, which was actually a pretty hopeless way of answering the question, is this action within the remit of the ECB given the treaty? And I think on any common sense definition, it's not within the remit of the ECB. And what they've been doing subsequently is buying government bonds in proportion to the capital key of the ECB, essentially GDP. So what are, what are the long run impacts of all this? I, I think that in all the retrospectives on the financial crisis, we haven't given enough weight to the fact that in the two decades before it, long term real interest rates were gradually declining from what had been pretty steady long run historical levels in an ex ante sense, basically towards zero. And I don't see how you can run a market economy for very long with zero real interest rates. And we've not really managed to escape from it. And of course, quantitative easing uh, it perpetuates that. Now, I, one of the phrases that I liked about the response to the crisis was that of Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary. And Larry said, you know, how do we get into this crisis? Too much borrowing and too much spending. And how are we going to get out of it? Even more borrowing and even more spending. Now, of course, this, was, this is a, a good response for the Keynesian short-run action. Now, for a period of 18 months, two years, this made some sense. But his very phrase, too much borrowing, too much spending, made it pretty clear that there had to be less borrowing and spending at some point. And this goes back to Alan's point about the fact that some of the Western economies, certainly the US and the UK, have simply not been saving enough. And we need to make adjustments in our economy to raise that. And it's very difficult to see how you can persuade people to raise the saving ratio if the real interest rate, long-term real interest rate stays close to zero. So we somehow we've got to find a way through this. It's no good central banks just pushing up rates for the sake of it. Mm. We've got to get to a situation where other measures are taken which allow central banks to return rates to more normal levels. Mm. Alan? Well, let me just bring a slightly unrelated issue, but something which has puzzled me and worried me for quite a while. If, for example, the Federal Reserve System in the United States uh, were to go bankrupt in some form or another, there's always the sovereign credit of the United States to back it up. What would happen in the condition, hypothetical granted, if the euro area broke down under those conditions, there's no backup. And where the levels of debt of the central bank uh, now emerge to a point uh, where it is of considerable concern, and I don't see this issue raised in any formal sense, uh, but it's clearly out there arithmetically. Let me just ask you, with regard to the uh, US, what do you think would the, are the long-term implications of the QE we did here? Well, remember that to reverse QE uh, is the old classical memory of, uh, of how the Federal Reserve would tighten money. Yep. By squeezing the balance sheet down, uh, they found out in 1922 that much to their surprise, it had the effect which is the became monetary policy, open market policy rather, uh, up to date. And we're using that same set of principles, which actually does work. It's strangely enough a, a replication of the gold standard adjustment because the process is one which causes equilibrium to occur very much like what would happen when gold prices started to move in the days of the gold standard. So the system is working in that regard. Uh, I don't see at this stage that we're going to deviate from that pattern. The, the things that do bother me is the uh, European effect on the global system should Europe fail. Mm. OK, well, that's again. So I just add a yeah, point to that? Of course. I, I absolutely agree with Alan, and I think it's very important to stress that QE is not some completely new monetary policy instrument that's been dreamt up. You know, this is an old traditional 
central bank instrument, open market operations. It's on a scale that is in some way, sense unprecedented, but it's not different. I and I remember Ben Bernanke saying, you know, the thing about QE is it, it works in practice, but it doesn't seem to work in theory. To which my reaction was, well, you've got the wrong theory. Uh, <laughs> okay, here's our first question from the audience by Patrick Leary, a Stern MBA 18. It's for Alan. Who is the most interesting person you've met? Uh, I wish I had met Alexander Hamilton, but he's not around. Other than that, I'll just lose friends. No okay. <laughs> kidding. Uh, Ivan Zhang, Stern MBA, 2019 on the emerging market economy. Uh, China's GDP growth fell to 7%. How do you think the economic growth of China will be in the upcoming five years? Oh, that's for Alan, I think. Well, uh, first of all, it's now down to 6% growth rate. 6%. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you have to realize that China is uh, a very significant part of the global system uh, in so many different respects. Uh, but let's remember that per capita GDP in China is one third of where we are. As, as difficult problems that we have, uh, nonetheless, the notion that somehow China is going to run ahead of us in all respects, I think, is a mistake. I think that uh, the policies that we're involved with, with tariffs and the like is insane, and uh, why we're doing it probably is uh, very deep in the psyche of somebody, except unfortunately it's an element in the Constitution of the United States. Remember, the original source of all funding of the American government was uh, basically tariffs. Uh, and we sort of... Sort of well, if it's in the Constitution, how can it be bad? Well, it's an excise tax. I mean, people think of tariffs uh, other than what it is. It's a tax. And if everybody engaged in warfare of this type, it would mean that you're withdrawing credit or purchasing power from a whole series of countries, and that means that they all go down. There, aren't, there are victors and there are losers in a tariff fight, but that doesn't say that the more important issue is both are losing. It's just one, the winner loses less uh, than the winner, but it's, they're taxing their populations, they're withdrawing purchasing power, and if there's any validity at all to the Keynesian econometric model, then one would shy away from that like the plague. Uh, it's not what happens. Uh, this one, uh, this question I think you both will like. How should we respond to populist political attacks on central bank policy and independence? This is from Josh Black, a stern Block Stern undergraduate student. I guess it's got to be to me, huh? Uh, I uh, uh, merely get a whole set of earmuffs and give it to central banks and suggest they wear them. <laughs> Mervin? So I think I'll give a slightly different answer to, to that. <laughs> the, um, it depends on the source of the, the attacks. As Alan said earlier, much of what we call populism is a cry for help. And I think the, the most important thing that we need to stress to politicians is that there's no point going around deploring the people who seem to vote for populists. 
and there's certainly no point calling them the deplorables, you need to understand why they are asking, this, why are they making this cry for help? And I think that in both our countries, there's been a big failure of politicians to understand why people were unhappy and why they were losing out. I agree with that. And, and I think the answer, therefore, has to be, let's do what we can quietly and calmly to explain to people what we can do and what we can't do. There's a very interesting um, film, and I, oh, I forgot what it's called now, but it's about the, the first Clinton presidential campaign. And John Travolta plays the part of Bill Clinton. And uh, he goes into a textile factory in New Hampshire. And the first thing he does is to empathize with their suffering, the job losses, the loss of incomes, etc., cetera, and, and the destruction of their local community. And he talks about his own background and how he suffered and how he understood why they felt like that. And then he said to them, having got their attention and empathized with them, but I want to explain to you why I cannot bring back your jobs. Even if we had a tariff on it, he would say, you're not going to compete in world markets. The markets you had in the rest of the world have gone. What we have to do is to find a way to make sure that the next generation doesn't suffer in the same way. We need to improve education, training, and so on. Now, it's easy to say that, but the lesson of it was, unless you empathize first, then you'll never get an opportunity to explain to people. My experience has always been that if you can empathize first, people will listen to a calm, rational argument. You can't just say these people are um, xenophobic, uneducated, ignorant. They're not. They do actually understand. And the challenge for central bankers is to explain things clearly enough in a way that people will understand, but do it in a way that's based on empathy. Mm. Now, that ought to be for politicians, but I'm not sure they've been very successful at it. And I think this also explains why the one thing I'd say that's common between the political situation here and in the UK, the issues are completely different, totally different issues. But what is common to both countries is that the political elite has failed to empathise. And as a result, they've completely lost touch with voters. And voters just want to vote for anybody else mm. other than the people they've been living under for the last couple of decades. OK. Uh, this question is from Gautam Natarajan, a Langone MBA, 2019. I guess it's for uh, Alan. You mentioned uh, uh, it's important to control entitlement spending for Social Security. You suggest you go into defined contribution from defined benefit. But how would you propose modifying Medicaid and Medicaid, Medicare health care spending so patients get appropriate treatments without excessive burden on the economy? Well, remember you put both issues on the table. They must be equal. In other words, you cannot have Medicare or Medicaid funding without the revenues arising somewhere. And so the question is always uh, what I, I find uh, disturbing is uh, politicians are playing single-entry bookkeeping. That is, they got to understand that in budgets, uh, there are two sides. There are revenues and there are expenditures. If you spend too much for too long, you will engender inflation. And everybody loses under those conditions. So I find that what has to happen is a much better understanding or maybe even some form of uh, another endeavor to try to make uh, every expenditure program carry with it the means of financing. We do that periodically, but even though it's a sound thing to do and a necessary thing to do, it invariably breaks down politically, or at least to the, to the state. Perhaps you have some lessons from England on how the U.S. could better control our uh, health care spending? Well, uh, of course, in England, we have controlled our health care spending so successfully that people think we should be spending a lot more. 
because uh, we send, spend a lot less and we do it through having a monopoly essentially through the National mm -hmm. Health Service and that there is private health care but we've been quite successful at ensuring that when the National Health Service acquires drugs it does so at a much lower price than would be the case elsewhere but there are real costs to it um, I've never forgotten that my wife who comes from Finland said that you know in Sweden and Finland they started with what you might call socialized medicine but they realized that actually you had to charge something for it and when you go to a GP in Sweden and Finland you pay a very small amount but you pay something in Britain you pay nothing this has an enormous difference mm. when they introduced the charge in Finland then when men woke up in the morning with a hangover shall I go to the doctor or shall I buy a beer I'll buy the beer <laughs> and so you cut out completely a lot of visits that were unnecessary. It's a good suggestion. <laughs> uh, I think we have time for one last question. This is from Matt Robinson, NYU Stern undergraduate. Uh, many of the current stresses in today's world are being driven by the proliferation of income inequality. Are central banks in any way responsible if so, can monetary policy address this? First with Mark Mervyn. Okay, I think the simple answer is no. They reflect much deeper trends. Uh, I think if you look at the measure of wealth inequality, that's clearly been affected by the movement of asset prices. But my belief is that the so-called increase in measured wealth inequality that's arisen over the last 25 years will go into reverse as long-term interest rates go back to more normal levels. But I would like to use this as an opportunity to say to everyone that you ought to read Alan's book. Alan Greenspan and uh, Adrian Wooldridge. It's a history, it's not just economics, it's a history of the United States. And there is no country really whose history is not more bound up with the history of its economy than the US. Um, and there's a lot of politics in it as well. So put it on your Christmas list and give it to all your relatives as well. Yeah, I will echo that uh, recommendation. I have started uh, reading the book and it's, it's quite uh, engaging. Uh, it's a page turner. As surprisingly, if, if you can think economic history can be, but this is, so uh, I do recommend it. It's called Capitalism in America. Uh, last, any parting comments, uh, Alan? <laughs> I think the, the last question was if, if central banks are responsible for income inequality, and if so, can they do anything about it? I'd just like to leave that question unanswered. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>